So Eli, what did we talk about in this episode? Um, we talked about some of my experiences um, being uh, a language learner, um, traveling abroad, um, and some of my experiences with both my religion, um, my background, and um, my current schooling and going to college in this crazy time. Yeah, let's get started. Welcome to Try with Ping. This is Ping Robert, and in this podcast, we will cover a range of different topics from culture, languages, and underrepresented stories. Join me with a cup of chai and listen to these stories. Welcome back to Chai with Ping. This is Ping Robert. Today we have a special guest that we worked for over a year, like before the whole pandemic started, and then. Well, I'm very proud of him because、uh, he's a freshman at USC, the University of Southern California. If I think I'm right,、um, and he graduated from Denver Center for International Studies this year. So, woohoo! Happy graduation and happy <laughs> admission to USC. Welcome, Eli. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you for coming to the show. So, a little background to the to the listeners. Like Eli and I, we worked together for your Mandarin class, and then we, yeah, even before everything started to go online, we already started online, and we meet weekly for、mm-hmm. your lessons and all that. Yeah, you're one of my best students. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So today we're gonna cover a little, you know, the experience of you being in high school and now graduating and already kind of taking classes and at USC. Probably not the best start, but like during this whole、um, new transition.、Um, so I wanna look at your background and your experience,、um, and you know, just like a, a formal. Not formal, casual chat. So let's start with、uh, your background. How did you grow up? And you know, just tell us. Sure. So I've、uh, I've lived in Denver, grown up in Denver, pretty much all of my life. I was、uh, born in Los Angeles, but moved moved to Denver when I was pretty young, about two or three. And、um, I went to a pretty normal elementary school,、um, and then. I think how I really got introduced to Chinese、um, was through my middle and high school. I actually went to a six through twelve,、um, so middle school and high school,、um, all at one place, the Denver Center for International Studies, as you said earlier.、Um, and yeah, I've really enjoyed my time there. I've been able to travel、um, through them and through other opportunities in Denver.、Um, and yeah, I mean, I really. Enjoyed、yeah. my time there. So, was your school charter school, private school, public school?、Um, so, my school it is actually a public school. It's part of the Denver public school system.、Oh. Um, I believe it started off as like a magnet school, so like special interests, still、mm-hmm. public, but、um, yeah, yeah, it's public school. So, did did you have to fill out any kind of special requirement to get in, or is just like anyone who is interested and can? Join. Um. So yeah, in a they actually do have an application process for sixth graders, which seems a little a little crazy having eleven year olds apply. But、um, I think a lot of the、um, reason behind reasoning behind that was、uh, just to kind of make sure that the kids really wanted to go there. And I think they had an interview process、um, where you got to go and sit down with a teacher, and they asked you why you wanted to go to the school, and、um, it really kind of helped. Sort out kind of the kids who whose parents maybe wanted them to go there, and the kids who wanted to go there for themselves. And, yeah. Would you say?、Um, hmm. I'm just trying to understand because I don't know the school that well. Would you say the student background is a little bit in a on a higher or middle upper class, like socially, economically? Um. Honestly, I don't think so. I think it's、mm-hmm. pretty pretty standard with. Um, a lot of Denver public schools. I don't think、Got、it's it. that different of a demographic. But. Yeah, but they just want to make sure that students and and family are serious about it. Yeah, 
Yeah. Oh, okay. So how how is it different? I mean, it's the name itself is very fancy. Yeah. Denver Center for International Studies. Did you have to learn about international studies? Um, yeah, that's a lot of the focus, and I think just a specific focus on um, like social studies classes. Um, every year, there's like a different special class that the school offers. So I remember in sixth grade, I took Intro to Cultures. Um, it's a pretty cool class to take at that age. And then seventh grade, we had anthropology class. Eighth grade, we had global service learning class. Yeah. Um, and things like that just kind of really help um, focus the curriculum towards an international um, yeah. kind of way. But there's the, the other focus, um, aside from the social studies classes, mm -hmm. is also on language. So mm. they have, they have, I believe they have six languages. It's... Uh, they teach Spanish, um, Chinese, French, Japanese, um, and then they also have, forgetting, oh, they have Lakota, which is an interesting one. And where, then, what, what country or where do people speak Lakota? That's a, a Native American language, so it's, oh, yeah. Okay, cool. And then there's the last one. Is there a um, language? Oh, Italian. So, that is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard a school around here offers uh, Italian. Yeah, they definitely have some more more niche languages that you might not yeah. necessarily find at a larger school. But yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. And so, how many years were you required to take them? Um, you're required to max out of the levels, which I believe is five years. Um, so I took five years of Chinese there um, first. And then I also started Spanish my sophomore year of high school. Um, so I got to take three years of that as well. And in the, in the meantime, now you're uh, continuing Mandarin with me. So, wow. Mm -hmm. wow, that's a lot of languages going on. It is. Do, do you speak any Hebrew? Um, no, I do not. I'm, uh, I, ha I, I learned a little bit around the time um, of having like my bar mitzvah and mm -hmm. um but yeah I, it's i really it's not a skill that i like retained or anything i don't speak Got too it. much of that no yeah okay cool cool so and how is your so i know that you're jewish which mm -hmm. i i have zero knowledge about only until meeting you then i did a little research and i'm pretty sure that you know the listeners outside of the u.s might not know as much about jewish culture so, so can you tell us a little bit about how your home culture looks like it's definitely not like a generalized experience but what about that like that part for you um that's a good question well i think my family is definitely on the more reform side of Judaism, um, but we we celebrate all the holidays. Um, we are members of a nearby temple, um, and so a lot of stuff that uh, we've done has kind of revolved around that. And I, growing up, I went to religious schools every Sunday um, at this at temple. Um, and you kind of learn about the religion, learn about the values, um, and get to meet some kids who have similar backgrounds to you. Um, and yeah, also one thing through, through my temple, I was actually able to travel to um, Israel and Poland as a um, really cool experience. We had um, my senior, the summer before my senior year of high school. Yeah, you told me about that. And then was it fun? <laughs> It was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So what was the intention of that trip? Is it for you to assimilate to the Jewish culture or like finding roots? What was yeah. the goal? I think a lot of it is kind of exploring a heritage and mm -hmm. um, understanding that. I mean, there is definitely a big kind of touristy side of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually, um, before the trip, before we went to Israel, we spent around three or four days in Poland visiting concentration camps which was, it was a very, very tough, very difficult part of the trip, but I think it added a lot of value to it and something that I really thought was important. I have another question. Recently, I've heard being Jewish is not an ethnicity only. It's also like who, people who convert into Judaism are also called Jewish. 
Yeah. And so what is it for you? For me, I mean, I think it's a very like fluid thing. I don't have a specific definition, but I know a lot of people would call it um, an ethno religion, I believe is the term where it's, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's a, it's a group of people who also have the correlating religion, but I think it's very fluid and um, I mean, definitely in the reform community, it's very accepting of new members and Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Were your parents Jewish or like, did they convert to Judaism or they grew up being Jewish? Uh, both of my parents actually grew up being Jewish, so. Oh, so that's like an ethnicity thing. Yeah. Oh, say, so. okay. Got it. Oh. Did you, like, so maybe I should interview your parents, but I was just like, because <laughs> like, for example, me, I'm a Christian. So when I'm looking for a mate or a spouse, then, you know, we meet at church. So Louis and I were both Christian and all that. Was it like it, like, do you expect yourself to be like that? Or you're kind of like, eh, it's all right. I, I definitely fall into the second category, I think. I don't, I mean, it doesn't matter that much to me. But. Okay, got it. Cool. And I, I guess your parents are not really strict on that either. No, not at all. Yeah. Okay, cool. Hmm. How would you respond? So I know this is definitely jumping off, but like, uh, how would you respond when people have that stereotype? Is like, oh, Jewish people are so smart. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I personally, I wouldn't take that much offense to it, but I think that it's definitely important to kind of steer clear of like stereotypes in general, whether they are positive or not, because they can just lead to negative outcomes. And I feel like you probably fit into that stereotype because like you're doing so well with so many different languages and <laughs> Thank studies you. on top of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. So then, okay, let's go back to the Mandarin part. Why did you choose Mandarin um, among all six of them? Well, that's actually, I do not have a really great answer for that, to be honest. I, I mean, I was going into um, middle school. I was a little 11 year old and I didn't really know which language I wanted to study, but I remember when I went on like a school kind of tour, um, when I was deciding where to go to middle school, uh, we walked into the Chinese class and I just, I, it really seemed like a lot of fun to me. It seemed, it seemed like the most unique by far out of all the languages that I had heard of. And it just seemed like kind of a fun adventure to embark on. I mean, here I am. So (laughs) wow. (laughs) can I say that you started because of the decoration in the classroom? Yeah, that's definitely, Big, big contributor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good to know. Because, yeah, I, I taught Mandarin for a lot of years now as well. And it's like, I never really emphasize on the decoration in the classroom or, like, how people are perceived and, and learning environment. But, like, today, hmm, you brought a very good insight on that. <laughs> yeah, then you also told me that you went to Shanghai. So what yeah. was the experience and when was that? So um, the summer before my sophomore year of high school, I got to go with a program called CIEE. And so they do like a month long language focused um, uh, kind of just travel program, study abroad. And so the the biggest part of it is the homestay. So I got to stay, I was staying with one other um, American student um, with a Chinese family. And that part was just truly amazing. I got to experience so much of the of the culture of the food and the language just for my like immediate host family and that was really really cool to see and then another big part we had we had daily classes of Chinese in the mornings and then one thing I really enjoyed about the program was they had us during our kind of lunch period um, we they had us kind of expose ourselves a little more to Chinese and we had to go and interview random people on our college campus that we were learning at so we just we kind of went up to random chinese students at this college campus who may or may not have spoken english and had a completely chinese interview with them so that was a cool experience wow okay and is that part of the coursework like i mean as an assignment yeah yeah it was like a graded assignment we had to do every day (laughs) how is it different from like the mandarin in class than between the the classroom mandarin and you know day-to-day regular people yeah mandarin. i think i mean the main thing that i noticed was speed uh, mm. i mean that might be kind of obvious to some people but just the 
in class you can kind of slow down take your time learning things but yeah i mean in in basically every language once you once you get out into the real world and kind of start talking to people you just your brain has to work so much more quickly and yeah 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 do you realize that people will use words that you have never heard before <laughs> yeah there are a lot there was a, quite a bit of that yeah and i think um there are definitely some tools for that, like Google Translate. Now with the technology we have, you can ask like, hey, could you type this in for me? Or, um, but a lot of it is just you have to use your like context clues and inference and do your best to kind of get by. Yeah, I have students or um, even the guests before, um, they also share like when they encounter language barriers, they kind of get emotional charge like they get sad or you know frustrated and all that did that happen to you um i think it, it can definitely be frustrating i don't know if i would say that happened to me in a large amount of mm -hmm. times but i think there were definitely some frustrating moments um mm -hmm. and but i think i mean you just kind of have to accept that that's that's part of the language barrier is, is kind of getting through those frustrating moments and doing your best to eventually become mm -hmm. fluent yeah, seems like you're more rational on that. It's like, yeah, I'm still learning. So you kind of like don't focus that much on emotions. Um, yeah. You just keep keep going and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Any culture shock there? Culture shock. That's a good question. I think one thing, there were just a couple different things. I don't know if I'd call them shock, but some things that I noticed that were just incredibly different than the U.S. And uh, one of the main things was just like, the way kind of people commute and go places. I think there was a let, I, I don't know if this may have just been the exact neighborhood I was in, but I felt like there was a lot less like um, strictness when it comes to like traffic laws and things like that. And I don't know, I just, I, it seems so crowded and it's, I mean, it's also the largest city in the world. So I'm sure that um, kind of adds some, uh, impact to that but I found yeah. that it was just there were just so many cars going all the time and yeah just people walking whenever there was a chance and I mean you you definitely get used to it but it was just a little different than the U.S. <laughs> so you're saying that like it kind of happened to you like when you see cars all over and then people are not following the the street lines and all that mm -hmm. oh okay and then people will be coming out and then just walking on the road yeah, it was it was a little more chaotic, but I think, I mean, it it works. So, <laughs> like everyone everyone gets where they're going. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good comment. It's like it works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think I think coming here is like wow, everything is so organized, especially on the road. It's like yeah. everyone seems to know what they're go like what they're doing, where they're going, mm. and so I kind of got frustrated as well because it's like if I get a tiny bit slower and then people kind of get frustrated with me so yeah that's true that's, that's probably the biggest um difference yeah in in traffic anything else um i don't know i can't think of anything off the top of my head i think i mean there's a lot of differences i think one thing that i that i definitely enjoyed was the the um food <laughs> um and i just the the kind of idea of like American Chinese food yeah. is, is a very real, like, <laughs> it's not the same at all. Um, yeah. And I just got to kind of experience like this whole new world of food, which I hadn't really like done before. Yeah. And it was really amazing. And I, I ate so much. <laughs> How is American Chinese, mm, Americanized Chinese food different from the real Chinese food? Cause I haven't tried. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it's a lot more um, like the dishes kind of all fit like a certain category. Like it's, it's like um, orange chicken or um, broccoli beef. And it's all kind of like very like, like you order one dish, but I feel like in China that it's like you have a table with like 10 different dishes and side dishes that all have different things. And yeah, just the food itself it's it's just different dishes like the yeah. i think a lot of what american chinese restaurants do is they like cater to like what what american like uh kind of people like, like, like a set of meal right yeah. so it's like 
the staple, maybe like noodles or rice, and then one mm-hmm. side dish. Yeah. Ah. Huh. That's true. I never. Yeah. That's a good point because it's like that's true. So. I haven't been to Taiwan, Ta- uh, China that many times. I grew up in Taiwan, so mm-hmm. yes, usually the bian dang, so it's like a bento box, a bian, we call it bian dang. There will be at least three kinds of side dish, mm-hmm. and yeah, so we never really just order one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. What is your favorite food? My favorite food, Chinese food, or just yeah. in general, Chinese, Chinese food. food. I think my favorite food there was there was this little like. Um, steam bun stand next to this um, this like train station I think it was and I went there every day it was the like the most dirt cheap food you could ever imagine I think it was <laughs> one yuan per like steam bun yeah. which converts to maybe like 20 cents right yeah yeah, yeah. something yeah. like that so yeah you can get a full lunch full meal for like maybe like 60 cents or something wow. and I had they had a couple different flavors, but my favorite was the um, yellow custard. I remember. Oh, nai huang bao. Nai huang bao. Yeah. Oh, so all the steam buns are. I guess it's called bao zi that yeah. you're referring to. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll put down the the pinyin for the audience if you guys want to check it out. How it looks like the the yellow egg custard steam bun. Mmm, that's yummy. So good. Um, yeah, I know. It's all it's like it's almost like a breakfast and but also it can be a snack or I will actually just eat it like a dessert too. Yeah, it works. Yeah. It works for whatever. Yeah. Oh. Hmm. I'm missing home now. <laughs> <laughs> so, next question is like what are the assumptions that Chinese people have about you? That's a good question. I don't Let me think. Um, I think, well, I think the main thing is that, um, I think a lot of people were were caught off guard when I started speaking Chinese, um, and they would try, they would start trying to like, um, like if at when we started interacting, they might start and try and like look some stuff up on Google translate or like get someone that knows English and then I kind of caught them off guard when I when I could speak I mean the limited Chinese that I have but when I spoke Chinese and it was kind of interesting to see that but I think it was definitely um in more uh definitely more of an effect when some of my friends who were American and knew a lot more Chinese than I did and were pretty close to fluent they just started speaking fluent Chinese and caught people off guard (laughs) And it's so interesting because Shanghai is such an international city, but still so many people are not expecting foreigners mm-hmm. to speak Mandarin. Mm, okay, that's cool. Cool, cool, cool. Any other stereotype or assumption? I'm just also thinking that what, what stereotype well, I have I can think you. of. Yeah. That's the main one. That one's particularly interesting because I feel like it's kind of the complete opposite here in the U.S., yeah. Like everyone expects people to know English. It's kind of the opposite. Oh, true. Very true. And yeah, you, you're, you're coming kind of connects to another episode. I'll put it down. Like mm-hmm. when Inda from Indonesia, she was talking about the same thing. She said that it's like, we are all expected to speak English here as international students. But when international students are in Asia, everyone wants to speak English to them. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. And hmm, let's shift gear a little bit to learning multiple languages. What is your experience about that? Um, well, like I said, I took, um, I, I did overlap a little bit when I was learning them. So I had, I think, two or three years where I was learning both Chinese and Spanish. Um, and I think Honestly, I think it's it's really beneficial to have learned one already, just because the idea, like all the basic concepts of learning a language um, seem a lot easier and more tangible and um, more accessible once you've already learned that first language. And I think for me especially, Chinese is, I, I would say, one of the hardest languages to learn coming from English. Um, and so going from uh, learning like a whole different alphabet um, a whole different set of like 
concepts like characters instead of letters um i think spanish seemed a lot a lot easier <laughs> to me because i knew how hard it could be yeah yeah wait so share it with us from a second language perspective how did you find um what are the tricks that you're using when you're learning mandarin such a hard language um i'm pretty sure a lot of listeners are learning mandarin right now and so mm -hmm. that's why like they click on your episode um what were you what were you doing well and how did you do that that's a good question well i think one of the first things that i had to like realize was it doesn't work like english does and I think like in English you have, uh, you can, you look at the, how the letters look and you can see how they sound. And then from how they sound, you can tell how they mean or what they mean. Um, and I think with Chinese, it's kind of like very disconnected in that way. Like by looking at a character, you don't know how it sounds if you don't, if you haven't seen it before and you can't know what it means. Um, maybe you can infer with a little bit of context and, some of the radicals that are included in it, but it's a lot more difficult. And I think it's a lot more for, for writing, at least, I think it's a lot more like memorization based. Um, and I think also just, just knowing that you need to be able to practice it is another super important thing. What, so, I mean, whether it's, I, I had the uh, opportunity to go abroad to practice it, which really helped for me. But I mean, even if it's something like, talking, read, reading a Chinese book, or maybe finding like a pen pal to write to. Um, those are all very useful just because, especially for me, I, I, don't re I didn't really have anywhere to practice it at home. None of my family speaks Chinese. None of my friends spoke Chinese. So I had to find a way to kind of uh, apply it. Good point. How did you remember the five tones? Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, to be completely honest, I still haven't really. Um, <laughs> like, uh, I don't, on some of the words that uh, are more commonly used, I definitely know the tones on them, but it is it is very hard to try and memorize tones for different words. But I think, and I don't know, this, you can definitely correct me if this is wrong, but I think a lot of times it's, um, if you're in your, if you're in a conversation, you don't need to rely on tones as much, um, just because you can kind of people can infer and kind of understand through like context. I don't know if that's wrong. I, yeah, I do agree. Yeah, okay. it's like it's for conversation and communications, you know. So then, if you kind of go off tone, I guess we still understand each other, and then we can mm -hmm. carry on that conversation. That's true. Yeah, yeah, definitely like in a more formal setting, you need to be able to know tones and mm. be able to articulate them. And, but I think in an informal, just conversational, it's, it's still important, but it's, you can definitely get by. Yeah. Without. Mm. Would you say, would you say like it's easier to remember the pronunciation rather than the tones? Yeah, I definitely. <laughs> okay. I think, I don't know, tones <laughs> are just, that's just something that like is completely foreign to to me personally, just I yeah. never thought of that as something that could be part of a language is like how you how you say the word. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Hmm. Which one is harder remembering characters or tones? That's a tough question. I think <laughs> I think remembering tones still would be the mm. most difficult. I think I don't know, remembering characters is definitely tough. And, but I think there are a lot of um, techniques to kind of help. You can like write them repeatedly or read and kind of just as long as you're exposing yourself a lot to them, it's, it's somewhat easy to memorize and learn. But I think, I don't know, I haven't come across a great strategy for trying to memorize the tones and know all of those. On the side, outside of the classes, um, what do you, do you do anything to help you to practice? Well, you already mentioned some of them, like you write to pen pals or use it. Well, but then how do you practice here in Denver? Um, well, I mean, I think a lot of it is you just have to make 
the best use of what you can. And so if you're taking a class in your class, like speak as much as you can, do everything you can um, to kind of practice. And then even just doing extra practice outside of that, whether that's writing or whether if you're speaking, you could record yourself into your, into your phone and see how you sound. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately the best thing is to be able to talk to someone who speaks Chinese fluently and kind of build up your conversation skills. Cause that's, that's definitely one of the more lacking out of, out of reading, writing, speaking and listening. I think speaking is definitely hardest for a lot of um, new Chinese learners. Cool. There, are there any apps that you used will help you? Um, I'm forgetting the name of one. I think that there are, there are a couple of apps that are very useful um, in kind of translating specifically Chinese to kind of learn some new words that are Google translate doesn't work that well with Chinese I've found, but there are some apps out there. I can, I can check later and find out, but sure. there, there are definitely some apps. That, cool. 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 Yeah. I'll definitely put it in the episode notes. So listeners, if you're interested, do check that out. Um, Hmm. I know in this question, it would be a bit tricky to answer because I'm a Taiwanese and your previous teachers could be Chinese, right? What are the biggest difference between people, like teachers coming from different countries? Hmm. Well, my current teacher right now at uh, USC is actually also Taiwanese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, honestly, I can't think of a huge difference right now. I definitely have to think more on that. But Okay. No worries. Cool. Well, good to know then. I mean, that's a good thing to know on education because like if teachers from different parts of the world and then it's not that different for students, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. So now you just you just started your um, semester at USC. Um, did you choose your major yet or it's just undetermined? Uh, I have chosen my major. I'm actually majoring in journalism. So Yay. pretty excited about that. <laughs> is, is the first year like more for like common cores or like general education or you have already dived in into journalism? Um, I'm actually, yeah, I'm taking an intro to um, journalism level course right now. Um, it's about kind of like exploring and navigating like media and news in like uh, the digital era so to speak so that's a very interesting class i'm enjoying it so far but th there is kind of the the um general education requirements that i still have to fulfill and things like that and i have to take my freshman writing class but you do you do kind of dive in from the start What do you hope to achieve from your major of journalism? That's a good question. I think that um, I don't have like a specific career goal in mind. Um, and I think I, I've always just kind of been drawn to, to journalism as just being able to like travel and being able to write and take photos and, um, explore the world and share that with other people and I think that I don't have a particular route that I want to go um, but I'm definitely open and I think that's kind of the beauty of college in some ways is that you get to you, you don't have to know what you want to do at the beginning and you can kind of switch that as you go and you can learn learn more and I mean it's a great place to find out what you want to do Many high school graduates, they have a hard time finding out what they want to study. How, how did you find out that you want to go for journalism? Well, it was actually a pretty, I had a random assortment of like majors that I applied to. And actually I applied to different majors at some different schools. So another one of the interests I had was architecture, which again, completely unrelated to journalism. And, um, also, I was thinking about urban studies, um, international studies, and I applied to like different programs at different places. But I think uh, the main thing is just kind of being able to like envision yourself there. And, and I think it's important to look into each program at each school that you're applying to and see 
really which you can best envision yourself in. And I think for me at USC, I just looked at some of the courses that they had, all these amazing like photojournalism courses that they had and they, um, the, the kind of school, um, they have a whole school dedicated to communication. Um, and it, the, the opportunities that I saw there were just really amazing. So that's why I ended up going with journalism there. Got it, cool, wow. Um, are you planning on part-time jobs or something like that or internship? Uh, I definitely want to get in some internships in college. I think mm -hmm. that that's probably one of the things I'm most looking forward to is being able to um, just go and like in, intern at real like big companies across the U.S. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of great programs for that um, through USC. And hopefully I'll be able to do that hopefully soon. Um, get to do some in-person stuff would be lovely yeah. but yeah, yeah. Mm. right now Eli is taking online classes because USC is like entirely online so um it's it's probably a very new and special um experience for now because a lot of students are taking classes from home and online so yeah I wish you the best and hopefully you know in in the future that we can hear from you again Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Chai with Ping. Let us hear your voices and stories. Please share this episode, like, and follow us on Instagram at Chai with Ping. You can also email us at chaiwithping at gmail.com. Till next time.